Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. Alex, have you ever found yourself in possession of a very powerful item? In real life? Yeah. Absolutely. I own a car. That's a 4,000-pound steel death trap. Oh, yeah. Just ask that bear. (laughs) I don't have to. It's dead. Exactly. It it was a one-time used death trap. You, You... Killed the thing and killed the, <laughs> killed the trap. Yeah, so the reason I ask is uh, I wanted to tell you a story about a show that I watched not too long ago. Um, oh, okay. So is it about a bear? It, there's actually no bears in this, <laughs> believe it or Thank not. Thank goodness. This I scared is, them off. This is bearless. You scared them off, yeah. There are, there's barely any there. There are cars, but the cars do Perfect. not actually factor into this story <laughs> at all. Oh, all right. I'll let you tell your story then. Without your bears in your car. I'll tell you the story, and then I'll explain why I'm bringing it up. So the show is called Lock and Key, and it's on... Oh, yes, that's a new Netflix series, isn't it? That is a new Netflix series, indeed. And uh, in case you're not familiar with it, it is based on the uh, IDW uh, graphic novel series. And uh, the general premise of the show and the comic and everything is it centers around the Locke family uh, and uh, what happens when they go back to their ancestral house sort of out in the middle of rural America that they call Key House. They call it that because they say that they like puns, but there's actually another reason. The house is full of magical keys. Oh, yeah, that's that's definitely not just a pun, then. That's wordplay. That is wordplay indeed. There's there's a lot of keys, but I'll tell you about the ones that are actually pertinent to the story I need to explain. Okay. So, you, first one you have is uh, the ghost key. And it's not like an actual key that's a ghost. What it does is uh, it uh, goes into a door that leads to the outside of Key House... You pass through the door after you unlock it, and your corporeal form falls to the ground, and you become an ethereal ghost outside of the house. So you can, like, move around in three dimensions, you can go up and down, but you are intangible until you go back through the door and rejoin your body. There's a a head key, which you actually can put into the back of somebody's head, and it will unlock a door that allows you to go inside of their head. Oh, that sounds fun. Doesn't it? And now, the thing is, you can go into your own head, and they use it to some interesting effect. Like, say you want to just learn everything you you want about British culture. You just get a book that's all about British culture, and you chuck it through the door and close the door, and suddenly you just know everything that's in the book, because it's in your head. That's a song, isn't it? Sure. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's, um, that's zombie. Sorry, go ahead. That's zombie. But you can also have a problem because other people could go inside your head and take out valuable information or mess around in there. You don't like that. That's a powerful key. But that's not the key that I really want to discuss here. So you told me about this key because you don't want to discuss it. Got it. I, I told you about the key I because it, it is important to the story, but it's not really the key that creates a problem for me. Okay. The key that I want to tell you about is called the music box key. I am going to give you this much information, that the music box key opens, and you're going to be fascinated by this, a music box. Okay. I am so fascinated by this. Okay, great. But I want you to guess, just guess, uh, uh, just guess one time, what do you think the music box allows you to do? Since you have a problem with it? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Um, it's very powerful. Yeah. I'll give you I that. mean, I assume it might be time alteration, since you can kind of wind up a, a music box to play. Oh, that, that would be good. That would be good. That oh, is, okay. That is not what it does, though. All right. Um, what about it lets you uh, listen to any conversation that's ever been had? That would also be very powerful. That is also not what it does. All right, then I okay. there's <laughs> unlimited possibilities. Yeah. This music box. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Um, because is it music related or is it not related to music at all? <sighs> let, let me just tell you what it is. Because okay. for me, the music box, it, it, the music box problem, as I'm going to call it, 
is what happens when you give a character an item that is too powerful too fast. Does it summon the Phantom of the Opera? Uh, oh my god, that would be horrifying. <laughs> no, no. If you are in possession of the music box, you open it with the key, so you have the open music box, the person who holds that music box can now command anybody to do anything. That's not even music box related. No, it That's really is mind isn't. control. Yes. It's, uh, I guess the idea is that, like the ballerina that's dancing in the music box, you can make anybody do whatever you want them to do. So Without I, limit? Yeah, I can, all I have to do is, if I open the music box, I could say, I could say your name, and say, eat a box of raw spaghetti, and you would have to go and eat a, raw, uh, a box of raw spaghetti now. BRB, you gotta go eat a box of raw spaghetti. Yeah, okay, you go ahead and do that, and we'll very, rejoin afterwards. It's gonna be very crunchy. Uh, so, so, so here's, here's the problem with this, and what happens when you give characters power like this too early, and especially when they don't know what the hell to do with it. We established, like, early on, that the, uh, the daughter, like the middle child here, she knows how the music box works because she makes the, the mean girl at school do a bunch of embarrassing things. Because, of course, she does. Of course she does. Yeah, of course. That's what kids do. And what some adults do. Yeah, exactly. If you had the power of the music box, of course you would do that. I have a few people at work I would make uh, jump in dumpsters. There you go. But here's where things feel kind of stupid. There's a thing that happens, I'm not going to give away too much information, just in case anyone wants to watch it, but not even halfway through the first season, <laughs> they've, they've gotten this key, along with the other keys that I've mentioned, and one of the bad guys has gone into the house and has their mother at gunpoint. Now, the kids come home and they realize something is wrong, so they do, of course, the first thing that makes perfect sense the youngest one uses the ghost key, goes through the door, and uh, goes up in a corp non-corporeal form to find out that, oh yeah, bad guy is here, has the mother hostage, essentially, goes back and rejoins his body, tells the other one, okay, hey, uh, we got a big problem. So they have all the keys. The first thing they do is say, we gotta hide the head key, because that's the one that this guy is looking for. He needs the head key to get valuable information from somebody. So they hide that key specifically in a stuffed animal, and then they do the only logical thing you could imagine since they are in possession of the music box key. They make themselves known to the guy and ask, ask him not to hurt their mom. Now, of course, he then uh, ties them up and takes all of their keys. Now, you can probably understand where my problem is here. Um, if they have a key that lets them control someone, then they need to control someone and get out of the situation and they're not using it. There you go. It's like Aladdin getting thrown into the lake, bound and gagged in Aladdin. Yeah. And he has the, the genie's lamp. Yep. And he's unable to make that wish to get himself free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, but in this case... They, they have the uh, ability. <laughs> they have the ability. And, and in that case... Uh, Genie threw him a bone, because he liked him. Yeah, exactly. And he saved his life. But in this, the keys don't care. Like, you, you get the feeling that the keys are pretty much, they don't really care if you live or die. Like, <laughs> whoever uses them just happens to use them. But you do realize that they have access to the key. They have access to the music box. They know exactly where it is. So they could have just gone to the music box and uh, said, hey, dude with the gun, uh, go away now, and never. Do you come have back. to like know the person's name? Oh yeah, they. they but you could have gotten that with the head key. Oh, they could have gotten it with the head key, but they didn't need to. They already knew who this guy was. Oh, okay, so, so they had this thing that gives them unlimited ability to control somebody else. Yes, more so than say an item in D and D or a spell in D and D, like suggestion or dom. Uh, I believe there are some like domination spells, mm -hmm. but even those have limits oh yes in them. yes you cannot command someone to do something they would not normally do right um like you can't elicit uh sex from somebody if they wouldn't normally do that right. i think for instance because that would be rather rapey um yeah. <laughs> you cannot <laughs> command people to kill themselves oh yeah because self-preservation that's a thing in a lot of 
of media that you have mind control. You cannot, uh, mm -hmm. even Doctor Who did that when they had all the people up on the rooftops. And they're like, yeah, they won't jump to their own deaths. Oh, yeah. You can't, like, make people kill themselves. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not how mind control works. Right. The survival instincts will not allow it. I can't remember for sure, but I think there was an instance where they had an option to ask somebody to basically uh, no longer be around using the music box. And I think they were not disallowed from doing that. They just chose not to. Uh, so this is a very powerful thing. Now, here's, here's the thing. The problem is, is that I'm talking about the show. In the comics, apparently, this is a key that they get much, much, much later on. This is like an endgame item <laughs> for them. But they introduce it a lot earlier in this show, and it still has to go on the same track, basically. But, you know, the bad guy then gets a hold of all the keys, so now he has all the keys, except the one that he was looking for. But you could imagine that, like, maybe he would do something with them, and and he doesn't really. So I, I sit there and think to myself, why did we introduce an item so very powerful and then no one bothers to do anything with it? You shouldn't have introduced this item in the first place. That's my thinking. Uh, that makes sense, yeah. If you're going to introduce an item that is clearly world-breaking mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways, like you could take over the world with that item pretty easily. Yeah, um, you really could. And no one has the motivation to use it for any good or bad. Like, it's not that no one's using it for for good. It's that no one's using it for good or evil purposes. They're not using it for self-gain. They're not using it to help someone. Mm. There's no real reason to have an item there that has no... That people do not have the motive to use for to, to gain from it. Or right. to help uh, benefit something from it sometimes people do stupid things in a writer's room not very good uh, adventure writing there no it really isn't but anyway the the general thing i found the music box to be a big problem because i started to think about this in terms of tabletop gaming and what happens when you have magical items especially and what happens when those magical items ended up being way more powerful than they really should have been the one thing when you get give someone a magic item and it's uh, a party that they understand is super powerful and they're not going to abuse it. Um, if you have a party that's good about that, you can get away with that, for instance. Like, it's the, hey, this thing can really break the, the game, but your characters hopefully aren't, like, super tyrants, uh, aren't, like, super narcissistic or whatever. Hopefully don't seek to gain immense power by using this item. Right, right. But... On the flip side, in story writing, if you're going to introduce an item like that, uh, there needs to be, like, kind of, I feel like, a morality battle between using it and not using it as well, because even if your characters aren't necessarily going to use it, if somebody finds out you have it, mm -hmm. and it's sufficiently powerful enough, it will attract attention. And it should attract attention. Yes. As these keys from my scenario definitely did like you know the the bad guys needed to get this head key and you know if you're picking up all these keys all over the place chances are they're gonna want the other keys too is this like kingdom hearts but terrible writing worse than kingdom maybe, hearts? maybe. <laughs> i don't know the, 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 here's here's another one that they introduce really early on and that the kids immediately give up because they're stupid is it, they, there's something called the Anywhere Key. And the Anywhere Key is basically you name a place, you have the key in your hand, you name a place you want to go, you put it into any door, and on the other side of that door is the place you wanted to go to. So you can travel so, like, anywhere. instant teleportation. Basically, it's instant teleportation. And, of course, because uh, the kids fall for like the, the plottings of the bad people, character or one of the bad characters in this is she fools them into uh giving giving her the key it's the problem with having magical keys folks you got to be careful with those but in terms of of game design i guess i was thinking about like you know in in terms of a, a, if we were looking at the du dungeons and dragons really any rpg when you're creating that chances are you're going to come up with like a magical item list or you know some suggested items how do you denote 
that these might be too powerful for like a level like these are not things you want to give to a level one starting party how do i make it very clear i don't want to give the wand of ultimate power to my starting party how can i make it clear to the like the gm that well, this I mean, is generally idea. in like a D&D terms, you'd have items that have like, not, sorry, not necessarily power levels. In some games, their power levels or level requirements are things mm -hmm. you can put in those. D&D um, doesn't typically have stuff that have level requirements, except for like spells needing a level requirement. Like you have to be able to cast fifth level spells. And that is definitely a requirement for some magic items is sufficient okay. spell casting or other ability of sorts. Mm -hmm. So that can be one way to do it is uh prerequisites okay. on items help but mm. without prerequisites you could say these are uh you could denote not in the items description like what it does but in its uh lore and its, its rules mechanics be like this is an item intended for higher level campaigns or, mm. or parties mm -hmm. um and would be sufficiently overpowered for anyone under level nine to use Right. Or this would be it literally game breaking. You could one shot anything under level nine. Like mm -hmm. this would be ridiculous to give to someone at level one because it would destroy everything. Um, one one of the other ways you can do that, uh, not necessarily do that specifically, but uh, one item type that has always been uh, a double edged sword is always the uh, either cursed item or intelligent items. Oh. Uh, okay. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, intelligent items at all. Aren't those the ones that talk back? Yeah, they have their own ego scores, typically. I don't know how 5th uh, edition did with intelligent items, if they exist. I think they do still. I don't. I haven't really looked into it. But intelligent items in, like, 3.5 had their own ego score, um, <laughs> which was a whole thing. Nice. But basically, um, they had their own, own will, uh, and they had, like, requirements... Uh, that they need to have met, or they just won't agree to work with you. That's neat. I kind of like the idea that you have to have items that have a lower intelligence than you in order for you to tell them to do things. Usually they actually have a smarter intelligence than you. Usually they're highly intelligent. Oh. Um, and they have a, a will, and they, they have, like, uh, some of them have, like, agendas they're on. So, like, a crusader's oh. sword might be like, yeah, I'm here to slay the unholy. Like, okay. You know, that kind of thing. But curse items are similar, too, where they're not necessarily bad, but they uh, sometimes require you to have a certain set of conditions for them to work. Like, I remember uh, 3.5, I think there was a sword or a mace or something that required it to be bloody to get the enchantment bonus. Oh. So you'd have to coat it in fresh blood uh, kind of deal to, like, get that to be like, all right, cool, now I'm satisfied and you can use me, like, properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So something like that, prerequisites or uh, requirements or the like, can make it so that you can give items to people super early, for instance. You can give someone a key to a door, they just don't have the access to the door at level one, in this case. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can have the music box, but I can't have the key yet. Or vice versa, you can have a mm -hmm. key, but you have no idea what it goes to. Right. Right, right. So it's right, like right. I have this really powerful key, and we can tell it's really powerful, um, and that can be used as a hook as well, um, because you can give players this artifact at level one, but mm. they have no idea what it is. It's like you were given this mysterious thing, and it resonates power, and it mm. resonates uh, this aura of just being important. You can have it so it's like drawn to the characters. So you, oh, we're gonna ditch it. Yeah, you find it again in your bag the next night. <laughs> um it right. doesn't let you get rid of it it's like meridia's fucking beacon in skyrim yeah it's like oh can i drop this no you cannot drop this i am meridia that is like my least favorite item if i see it in a chest in skyrim i take it and i go not today satan and i close the chest after not taking it yeah yeah i'm like i don't want to do your quest or have you in my inventory you won't shut up <laughs> It, yeah, I don't know if I really like the idea of items that end up being more interesting than my character. <laughs> that's, that's like um, the... it's, a, it's, it's like the NPCs that are interesting. It's, you, it's a balance right. between making them interesting that you want to figure out what they do or what they're for or what their purpose is, but not so much more interesting that the story 
becomes just about the item. Right. You still want your story to be about your players and their adventure. And that can center around what they do with this item and what the item does to create uh, chaos and uh, strife and all these situations that normal people without this uh, MacGuffin, as it were, would not come into contact with. But where you've got this key that Mm -hmm. someone's looking for, that all these people are looking for, they're going to find it. They're going to use all their means to find it. They're going to use magic and information, and they're going to pay people off. And that is what bad people do, and that is what people who are think that your item is uh, worthy of their cause. I suppose the lesson in that is also, if you end up with an item of extreme power, it's going to attract a lot of very negative attention, and <laughs> maybe to your detriment. And not even necessarily negative attention, it's going to attract the attention of people who want to take it from you. Right. Um, whether their goals are noble... Uh, like a paladin who thinks you have a holy relic that can restore their their deity, mm-hmm. um, or whether they are evil intents of someone who wants to collapse all of society. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, okay. you can have a druid. You can have a druid who wants to take that item you have to collapse society, and that would still not be an evil intent to that druid. It would right. be a quite noble intent to restore nature, uh, right, uh, in their eyes. Mm-hmm. So that that goes with the whole good and evil and morality being subjective and objective to. The point of view you're coming from there. But yeah, I think the thing with that too is, and I haven't played in a lot of games that have items that are super powerful, but I don't feel like a lot of times I hear that the stories are about this item drawing attention to the party, people who want this item, uh, who want to take it from this them. Uh, because that, it, it makes for really interesting storytelling. Uh, in in that, uh, one of the other things that I start thinking about is, uh, and I don't think it says prevalent in like a, a 5e, but I think that it was in like 3.5, was attunement. Yes, yes, yeah. you have to attune to items. 5e, I think you have a similar thing. No, I think 5e it's you have there. to attune. I don't think 3.5 you didn't have to. Oh, okay. I know that it's on the character sheet, but I've never had to use it. Yeah, that's kind of like once you get a magic item, you have to kind of attune yourself to it somehow usually there's like you have to dedicate some time to it or perform a ritual or uh depending on the item specific situational things right. because that way you can't just hand off a magic item from one person to another person have it immediately be effective is it the arcanist it's a uh, uh it i think it's just in ua right now but their whole thing was always about like attunement is kind of how they gain power anyway because they have to have magical items um, in 5e though in 5e uh but, but the... 5e is so magic item light they're like yeah we're going to make it less magic item yeah i don't know if that's why that class hasn't really gotten full into the <laughs> main and, cycle and, and, yet. and to be completely fair there too that's a lot of the reason the low magic items in 5e it's really weird because magic skills, typically, but damage for other classes doesn't usually go up very much uh, uh, as they level, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. except for like sneak attack and some other stuff and bonus stuff. But magic tends to get really more powerful uh, over time, start weak, and get powerful, and then exponentially they just get, <laughs> I've got a wish spell! Yes, you're super powerful now. Yeah. Um, but like a fighter will never achieve that level of power, typically. Right. Um, so right. it's it's really interesting that they're they would nerf magic items. Uh, mm-hmm. I think they wanted to curb the dependency on them. Uh, but, yeah, but in doing so, you kind of make their rarity cripple uh, mid to high level non magic users. Right. Uh, unless they uh, multi class or spec into something that uses magic to enhance their ability. Mm. I you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking the artificer. Oh, okay. The Artificer class. Because, well, I mean, the Artificer kind of is about the items anyway. It's all about them stats, about them stats, about them stats. It's all about the turrets. For me, me, the Artificer would be all about the turrets. Yeah. I want to have deployable turrets. Um, But, I mean, that's more of an ability that they have than than anything else. But I think that for them, they have to have certain amounts of attunement to different items in order for them to gain abilities but i I think that's probably the reason why they weren't introduced to begin with because other classes 
don't really utilize that. I mean, they do have complete item lists of different uncommon, rare, and even legendary items. Right. But you don't... I mean, at least not in my experience, you don't come across many magical items. It's very rare that you would. Uh, yeah. Even if they're not particularly powerful items, you know? I got my, my sweet scimitars, and I guess they're magical because they, they do more than a normal weapon. Oh, you mean the, the sword you got from the Gith? My Gith Yankee okay. s- sabers, which you, are you, kind when's of... When's the last time you played that game? A year and oh, of change ago. Oh, okay. So, so fun fact, Nathan. Yes. Um, uh, I know you probably don't know this, but those swords, whew, those are probably going to cause your character a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, I gave one of them away. To who? To my friend Connor. One of the other players? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just gonna let you know that those swords probably gonna come back and bite you guys in the ass. Oh. See, eventually yeah. I was probably not gonna use them anyway because I'm a monk. So, weapons are kind of not a big thing for me anyway. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's not so much that they're good weapons necessarily yeah it's that uh if you look it up nathan if you if you take the chance and look up gith yankee and gith zerai um they have a special weapon called a silver sword oh yeah these are silver swords aren't they yeah they're silver sabers yeah and that's usually what they use and see these things are really really fun weapons and they will hunt down anyone that steals them or has them oh but but they're mine yeah, but they will hunt you down for them. Okay. Um, because what they can do is, on the astral plane, uh, the silver swords can actually sever the link character has, or a, a enemy or any living being has. They can sever that astral chain. Oh, so if I'm in the astral chain? Uh, ast- astral plane, the ethereal ast- realm. Oh, okay. Um, I believe, I, I haven't looked up in a while, and I don't know if they changed the lore for it, but, like, if you're traversing on the astral plane, for instance, you can interact with people normally, but, like, um, kind of, kind of deal, like, you can interact with that stuff, but the, these are sp- specific to, actually, I want to look this up, hold on one second. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking a gander to see if I can find it on a wiki right now, but this is not quite what my scimitars can do. Also, they're scimitars. They're not swords. I mean, I, I mean, they're still Githyanki or Githzerai weapon. Uh, um, this this is true. The Githyanki silver swords are actually apparently a legendary weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, they have an attunement for a creature with a psionic ability. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a do 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 do. There were weapons given to the knights and leaders of the Githyanki race. They were powerful magic great swords. Um, depending on the wielder's rank. Uh-huh. Um, their most notable property was the ability to sever an individual silver cord. This is this is what I'm talking about. So allegedly, based on the silver sword gift, every Githyanki knight warrior uh, was given one of these weapons once they achieved sufficient level of power to will the blades into existence. That is how I imagined my sword looking. My swords. I had twin swords. Looking... They were pretty sweet. They gave me a plus one to attack. Uh, this doesn't have information about the, the silver cord. The the way that uh, Dom described it to me is that they were literally, um, they were 1d6 plus 4 weapons. That all, yeah, they're, 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 they gave me legendary weapons. to attack, yeah, and I had two of them. But it doesn't really make much sense for me because I'm a monk. I started to realize no, it was kind of are, useless. I can't do Flurry of Blows with two of them equipped. But every Gith Yankee warrior was given one of these weapons. She's assistant. I, fa- I found it for you, Nathan. I oh, found it. Mm-hmm. Okay. The astral body would be accompanied by the astral forms of any items and clothing that were magically or radiated a magical aura. While projecting your astral self is connected to your physical body by a silver cord that stretched out behind you for about 10, three, uh, ten feet uh, or one foot. Okay. I don't know. That's, that's different. Um, depending on the version of the spell and then became invisible and intangible. Very few things could sever the silver cord. A powerful psychic wind, a Githyanki silver sword, or the will of the gods. The physical body left behind appeared alive, but did not require food, water, or air, and did not age. Um, if the traveler's physical body was slain, death followed the projection some minutes later. If the astral self was slain, the traveler then returned to his or her physical body in a coma. Physically altering the astral plane required a spell such as plane shift. Brought the 
travel her wholly into the astral with no silver cord to anchor her to the plane of origin. So I, I believe severing that silver cord would no longer anchor you to your body. Oh. So it would, it would basically leave your living body in a coma and you would oh. no longer exist, uh, have the ability to return to your physical form. Oh. So, uh, yeah, you, ha- you potentially have a pair of swords that have that. Well, um, I have one. I gave you the have other one. one there are two of them, and yeah. the Githyanki will go out of their way to find shards of silver swords or get them back. Uh, so you potentially have a lot of enemies. Oh, yeah. Here's, here's the thing. Uh, no owner of a silver sword would ever willingly allow a non-Githyanki to hold their weapon. Well, we killed the Githyanki. So yeah, but, but other ones, they'll, they'll, de- they'll define if, it. If any silver sword found its way into the hands of a non-Githyanki, at least squadrons of Githyanki were sent to by a furious Lich Queen to take mm-hmm. it back at any cost. If the squad sent failed to retrieve it, they would be executed. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so get, get ready if you ever go back to the game for squads of Githyanki. Well, there is one other little wrinkle in this, though, Alex. Um, currently, I'm actually in a Technicolor Hell Dimension. Fun fact, yeah. Githyanki are from Technicolor Hell Dimensions. Oh! They're, they're, uh, they, I believe, reside in the uh, hellscape of Limbo. Oh, so I'm probably there. You might be. You might be. Oh, and I got their sword. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that Rembrandt is the lock children, and my sword <laughs> is the music box. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. it's, it's a weapon that uh, potentially uh, your character doesn't know this, but your, your weapon has the potential, if Dom is doing this the way I think Dom was doing this, <laughs> to be an incredibly powerful tool to obliterate astral forms. Oh, well, yeah. There's that then. Yeah. So I've have um, been utilizing my weapon, my item of power. I figured I could tell you this because it was relevant to our episode topic. Yeah. Yeah. No. That's, where that's where you know. don't know that your weapon actually has its potential. Assuming that it is one of these, if the, if it's from a Gith Yankee, it is probably one of these. Probably is. Now, see, I um, I figured everything might be okay because I did identify them, and they said that there was no like curse or anything on it. Yeah, there's no curse. There's no curse. There or is just this legendary ability mm-hmm. to sever uh, silver key chains. That's sweet. Uh, silver cords. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I assume the person who identified the swords for you doesn't really know about silver swords. I I identify. Uh, I don't think myself. an identify spell would be like, oh, there's this enchantment on it. I, I don't uh, think it's an enchantment. I I actually identified it uh, over a night or something like that. I, oh, okay, yeah, you wouldn't see. You would have to know about the silver swords to be able to right, like in character, know about the silver swords. Right, right. So yeah. I got this. Uh, so I ended up with this sweet pair of swords. That do a lot of damage. Yeah, so you ended up with a sweet pair of silver swords that did a lot of damage, and you have no lore background to what they are. Okay, so basically, uh, Lock and Key is uh, me. Yep. Uh, Lock and Key is basically... uh, So, hey, that's an interesting fact, folks. Apparently, the same problem I was complaining about with the music box, uh, my character did unwittingly... (laughs) The, the difference here yes. is that your character doesn't know. Yes, that's the and difference. And the lock and key people they know did. what these things do and know right. where to find them and how to use them. Right. This is the and, difference between yeah. good storytelling <laughs> and yeah. shitty writing. And as I said, in the, in the graphic novel series, apparently this is something that they did not get until very much later. The music box key is a, like basically an endgame item when they, when they had the series. In, in the show, though, they like find it in episode three. <laughs> oh, so, what is this music box with a keyhole in it? Oh, look, and I can put it in there and I can ask anybody. Oh, like I can ask my brother to shut up and then he literally can't talk anymore. Oh, this is going to be an interesting thing to utilize if somebody ever breaks into our house and holds her mom at gunpoint. This is going to be, this is going to be super useful. I we're feel not like that was to. all in the show and that's all foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> if they just said that in episode three. <laughs> so I guess I, I'm fine with weapons that are uh, powerful. I just feel like they have to be 
implemented well and they have to be utilized correctly or it feels like it's very game breaking i mean i don't think you're utilizing yours correctly and it's not game breaking that's only because uh, it, i don't know what to do with exactly them. and that's the thing it's either you have to utilize them well or they're game breaking or you don't have the players uh necessarily know what they do and they have to have a journey to find that out or you have to have a way to reveal that and then they have to be like oh shit um I gave one to Connor, who was also the frontline fighter, because he's a oh, he's a halfling barbarian. Oh, there you go. And uh, I gave I gave him one, and he was kind of like, oh, okay, but I mean, I have this pretty sweet hatchet. <laughs> like, like he like he didn't really even care that much that I was giving him the scimitar because he already had like a plus two hatchet, and that was pretty sweet for him. Right. Uh, so he's like, my axe is great. I, I, and then, and then you're gonna have these squads of Gith Yankees coming at you, and you'll be like, why do these guys keep attacking us? <laughs> no, but here's the question I have, just in case I need to note note for the for the record. Um, if I just gave them the swords, would they just leave? No, they are not lawful creatures. Oh, so <laughs> they're from like the chaos realm. For oh. real. They're from uh, the ever uh, undulating chaos of Limbo is where their outer plane is. They are chaotic. Where I probably am right Probably now. where you are. They're like chaotic right. evil, I'm pretty sure. They will just kill you. Uh, did you ever play Neverwinter Nights 2? Mm, did I play? No, I think I, I might have played the first one. Neverwinter Nights 2, you're given a silver shard. That's the thing that, that's your MacGuffin from the get-go. Uh, and you're being attacked by uh, Githyanki. Nice. And uh, some slods, I believe, uh, they're attacking your town. And uh-huh. your foster father gives you the silver, uh, silver sword fragment. You don't know what it is, but you find more of them. And it ends up being that you have a piece of a silver uh, sword. Oh, okay. okay. And you have to do whatever with it. I never finished the game, honestly. But right. it's a Githyanki silver sword shard. And they sent okay. uh, a very powerful Githyanki uh, wizard or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they command like a small army of uh, bladelings and slods to come mm-hmm. take you back. Like they oh, burn down a great. town to get a, a a shard of a sword. Sweet, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, then I guess it's it's a good thing that I'm in this hell dimension with literally. It's a good thing you got two of those swords in your party. Yeah, and it's it's pretty sweet that I have. Uh, that that the only other person that's here is uh a, is a retired military dude who walks with a limp now because of an injury he suffered in the war and isn't even part of the party. Very nice. Good job. Literally the brother of one of the characters <laughs> who just insisted on fighting uh but is like so weak that he was we he was at risk of dying a couple times because he got hit once. So he's the only character I'm with in this hell dimension. There you go. So um, the rest of the party didn't end up here. Uh, I only have myself to blame. I I tried to like uh, shadow step down into this hole where they were opening the portal. And then I I couldn't dodge out of the way when I realized it was a portal. And And you fell into the portal? I I fell fell into the portal. This other character, uh, Roger the the brother of our druid thought that he could um jump in front of me and push me out of the way before I went through the portal I'm a thousand pound turtle yeah fa- falling uh you know into a hole so um so that did not work obviously so yeah okay so great now I'm in a hell dimension and I have a bunch of chaos creatures that want a sword back that's uh yep sounds good. about right I feel like I need a music box key. Uh, I think you got one. <laughs> no, I need the thing that the music box... I know, I need one that just commands people to do things <laughs> at a moment's notice. I just need that item. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's terrific. Uh, okay, so uh, items that are very powerful. Apparently, I have one, and I probably shouldn't. Uh, good Good to know. Uh, Alex, just out of curiosity, if you were to give advice to... Uh, people that are making games out there. Uh, they're working on their item list. In terms of thinking about uh, what a powerful item is or how to avoid making it too powerful. Oh, don't avoid making it too powerful. Uh, make it oh. tell an interesting story. Okay. 
If you're going to, if you're going to, and you want to add items and artifacts and relics that are super powerful, uh, whether the characters know it or not, um, find a way to in the item itself, uh, in its description and how it's written, find a way to write in a decent hook or mm-hmm. ways to uh, evolve the story with it. Find it, uh, give it ways to make it tell a story uh, by it being in your adventure. Okay. Okay. So in this case, Nathan, uh, mm-hmm. your silver swords uh, will tell a story by being in your adventure if Dom decides to start throwing squads of Githyanki at you to recover it. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, Great. A music box that uh, that can control people will garner attention because, well, the church wants it, and the evil guys want it, and everyone who has an agenda that wants to gain power want it. Right. Um, exactly. So that, that it tells story. Right. Yeah. Even I'm if it's poorly written story. <laughs> I'm all in favor of uh like legendary items actually having legend to them and not just being a different color code than other items. <laughs> so... It's orange. Did it's I hear orange. you say Thunder Fury, Blessed Blade of the Windseeker? Yeah, absolutely. I got I, I played Borderlands and there was an orange so it's uh it it's a better weapon than it has red flavor text you know that it's good um but uh but there's not necessarily a lot of lore to to some of those weapons uh, right. depending on which uh which games that you're playing and everything i know they, um they yeah I, I, one of the things uh, that they did in world of warcraft for legion is they had the artifact weapons uh, and those had a, a detailed b- a lore to them because they're legendary weapons in the game. They're not legendary, legendary like they're not Sulfurous Hand of Ragnaros legendary. Mm-hmm. They're items that have been used by other characters in the lore uh, for specific tasks, or they're like super memorable weapons, like the Ashbringer and the Corrupted Ashbringer, um, like Doomhammer, mm-hmm. um, like the. Uh, blades of the fallen kings. The rogue gets the the blades that killed uh, King Lane of Undercity of Lordaeron. Um, the Death Knight gets pieces of Arthas's uh, blade Frostmourne to forge new weapons from. Oh, um, yeah. So the weapons net they did really a good job uh, with those for storytelling. Like they made the weapons really powerful and they made them like. A thing they made a whole mechanic around these that told story and made it so you can empower these weapons and change how they look, but they also told the story of what happens, what these were used for, and what they uh do in lore mm-hmm. um and I en- enjoyed that. I thought it was rubbish when they kind of went to the new expansion they kind of deactivated all of that, so it's not as rewarding to the players who get to play through that now with those right because they're still a big part of the story but you're not getting all the stuff that came during it because it's all kind of been phased out so you're still getting the weapons you're still getting to upgrade them and all that stuff but it's not like the thing you have to do you can ignore that right entirely right. even though you'd use those weapons through the entire expansion mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but they did a good job with that and it was really fun to get these fabled weapons from in lore. Yeah. Um, that weren't just, uh, oh, look, it's an orange. No, these are like, uh, they were a tan. They weren't even legendary. They were artifact weapons. Oh, yeah. We're going into Diablo territory for that. Yeah. The unique. So you, so you get right. the, uh, yeah, these, these were like, you. they all had the same things on them, but you could customize. They had their own like, talent tree. They were really fun to use and and customize those that was fun um and it was really cool to see the different backstory of the different weapons because you had to unlock each with its own quest chain sure sure yeah that's good that's good um i feel like uh we'll have to come back and and hit the idea of items in a new direction maybe in another episode because it is something that we really we really haven't talked about before Uh, itemization Itemization. We really haven't discussed it before. Have I don't we? think we have. No. Um, and there's a and, lot and to it. There is, because I know, for instance, with the game dot hack, uh, GU and the original series, um, you don't gain abilities as your character. You gain abilities based on the items you're using. Oh a boy. Lot of times. Yeah. So yeah. your attack skills are based off of 
what weapon you use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and in terms of like, we haven't really talked a whole lot about item crafting or enchanting. Uh, I don't oh, think and then, we've really talked about and then Yeah. I know you've been playing Martyr a little bit. A little bit of Martyr, um, yeah. The weapons there dictate what your abilities are. Mm hmm. Yes, it does. It's so you can change out your weapon. Yeah. And it gives you a whole different action bar of what you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and bring something like that. Uh, you're right. We could do a whole episode on how you can change items and itemization and customization uh, and enchants and stuff. Right. Um, to make a whole different gaming experience just based on itemization. Yes. Uh, which then may become a little bit of a min max thing, but I think it'd be fun because uh, it, it, that specifically, and I think I ch- was trying to do something similar esque. Uh, in one of the RPG systems I was building, mm-hmm. uh, is that you can make it so that your items dictate more so than any class. What you use dictates what you can do. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, we'll uh, we'll probably pick this up uh, on a future episode and uh, hit items in a, in a different way. Uh, in, well, in a we'll, different we'll hide items in a different chest. We're going to hide different keys in different parts of this house. Uh, different <laughs> teddy bears. Yeah, in different parts of the Delve house, we'll hide the keys. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe I'll have a key blade. That's what... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, but for now, I think we've uh, talked about overpowered weapons uh, long enough. Uh, so... If, uh, Alex, the folks out there wanted to find all of the OP items that we have hanging around, where could they go on the internet? Probably just come over to our houses sometime and check our closets and our pantries. I got some, I got some pasta. I would prefer they don't do that. Yeah, quarantine, don't come over. Uh, well, no, just in general, I don't, uh, that's usually considered breaking and entering. (laughs) Only if they break in, if they have a key. It's not breaking in, or is it? If, it's just if they have the, the anywhere key, I didn't ask them to use that to get into my house. If you got a key, it's not breaking and entering unless you stole the key. Then it's theft. You stole the key, but then and you then st- use it to, to to get into a house. I think uh, that's a this legal is not question. legal advice. Yeah, no, this is not legal advice. <laughs> Don't use this to figure out how to. Let this me is not a credible uh, Still defense. Bad. Still bad. Don't do it. <laughs> Just, this is not a credible defense in a court of law. No. Do not use it. No one, no, you, you are not going to use a defense, hey, this key just let me go anywhere, and I just chose to go <laughs> into a bank. But I got the key to the city, so I thought I could go anywhere in the city. I wanted to go into this vault. I heard that they had gold there. What do you want from me? <laughs> uh, yeah, don't, don't use that in fantasy court, folks. That's not going to work. Uh, but uh, where else could they go... You could find all of our OP uh, items and content over at DelveCast.com. That's right. Uh, you can find items such as the Delve Podcast and items such as videos and articles. We have a lot of that over there. While you are there, why not try out uh, Patreon? Check out some of the stuff that we have over there, including uncut episodes uh, and some early releases for uh, some of the stuff that we do. Uh, and if you would like to follow along with everything that we do, check us out on social media. We are on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and our uh, podcast is over at Delve Podcast. That is correct. And you can also find the podcast on every podcast app known to mankind, including Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever you want to call it, uh, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio. It's all there. Just look for it. Maybe subscribe so that you get the episodes as soon as they release. Right. Uh, and, and if you feel like talking with us, you can always email us. We have an email up on our website, I believe. We sure or do. Or you can join us in our uh, usually somewhat quiet Discord channel. We always love to have uh, friends, community. Uh, we have a small community, but we enjoy their presence very much, so. That's true. Um, mm. We like to do live shows once a month with y'all. Uh, and we usually have a couple people hop in and discuss different things in life and gaming just for fun we had a lot of people this last week this, yeah. this last uh, episode we had everybody so that was every all great. five of us everybody <laughs> everybody came in uh well actually james was in for a little bit too he didn't say anything but he was he was there that's too. that's fine so there was that's six fine. that was actually up oh, to six. six you don't have to talk you can just come in and type if you want to you can type 
you can type. You can check us out on Twitch. We'll, we have it on Twitch, too, so if you, you're not yes, on our Discord Yes, we usually uh, mm-hmm. livecast on, on the Twitch, which we have one for Delve Podcast. Uh, and sometimes I stream a game from my personal Twitch while we talk, because I've been trying to get uh, a little more into streaming. That's right. And Plus, it's always nicer to look at like a game or something than just a Discord chat. This is also on, true. On this is also <laughs> true. We're still new with this relatively we're, we're relatively we don't know what we're doing relatively we don't know what we're doing and uh that's why it's probably a good thing we don't have this music box anyway <laughs> thank you for joining us on this episode uh and uh, always remember that if nothing else you have the key the most important key do you know what the most important key alex is uh breathing no you have the key to my heart i that's right. didn't want to say that well Nathan. That but now, corny. now we went there. Now it's now I'm and now I'm going to unlock now, your heart. Now we have king. It's the is it's it a heart shaped box, Nathan? No, it's it, I have a key to your heart shaped box. No, it's it's the key to Kingdom Hearts. It's a key. No, to it's hearts. a key to the heart shaped <laughs> heart shaped box. You got a key to it, and Nirvana is suing you for it. <laughs> Again, not legal advice. <laughs> giving legal advice on what's going to happen <laughs> if you have a heart-shaped box. I don't know what the heart-shaped box would do as a magical item. It would thump, and it would be inside your chest and fill with blood. That seems like a very useful item. I think we should probably all have one of those. <laughs> okay, folks, we're gonna go now. Um, <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We'll see you on the next one. Bye. Bye. The thing that I'll tell you is, uh, toward the, the end of the season, there's also another thing that happens that has nothing to do with those keys. There's, like, another key that has to go into a crown, and you can control shadows if you, if you have that together. Uh, so they do a stupid thing, and, uh, the person who knows where the crown is, which is where the evil shadow creature is that they're trying to control, they take the key to the crown, and of course, the second they get to the place where they know the shadow is, it takes the key, puts it in the crown, and wears it. Because of course it did. But then couldn't you control the shadow? Not With if... the music box? Not if the, not if the shadow's now wearing the crown itself. So it controls itself? That's it can control other thing. shadows. But I thought that that was fascinating. It's like, okay, so you know that the big bad thing that you're trying to control and manipulate is in the place where one half of this item is, and they need both halves to make something work. So take that other half to that place. (laughs) Or you could have taken the other thing and bring it back to where the other part is. (laughs) But, you know.